Greetings and salutations, friends, and welcome back to more Warhammer 40k lore. Where today we are going to have a look at Orc Freebooters, piratical greenskins. Which leads us to the first and most obvious question what, if any, are the differences between a pirate orc and a regular orc? Well, honestly. <laughs> Not a whole lot. Uh, both will steal anything that isn't bolted down, and will only pause for the briefest of moment to get the bolt cutters before stealing that which is bolted down. And in terms of temperaments, if anything, the freebooters are even more aggressive and unrestrained. <sighs> which is impressive in and of itself. But the largest difference, partially due to the aggressive nature of the Orc Freebooters, comes down to organization. Whereas the average green skin, and hell, even goblins or snotlings, have a larger organization behind them, not always the safest thing, mind you. Having somebody behind you in Orc society might be the preceding event to having a snife in your back, but hey, details. The point is, you have a large organization to semi-rely upon. A tribe, maybe, with all of the variations and scope and scale that that classification entails. A small, local tribe of maybe a couple hundred individuals, struggling for dominance with hundreds of others equally sized tribes. Or maybe, it'll be a continental-sized tribe, vying for dominance over an entire planet with other equally large orcish familiars. Maybe, maybe you could even be part of a vast interstellar orc warg, raiding dozens of planets cutting a swathe through the galaxy where our humble greenskin is but one amongst millions. But regardless of the local organization, each one of these orcs will also be a member of a larger clan, be it the Blood Axes, for example, or the Goths, or even a local alternative. It doesn't need to be one of the major ones, after all. So, in other words, every orc has some kind of connection to the orcs around him. This is where the main differential to the Freebooters come into play, because they are not a clan, nor do they identify themselves with any clans. There are no Goths or Blood Axes in the Freebooters' warbands, or even crews. The only connection they have with any other greenskins are those in their immediate vicinity. Their ship brethren, the crew, and in some cases, the crews of nearby orc warships as part of a particularly successful captain's entourage. Though this latter example is very, very rare. For the life of a Corsair is harsh indeed, <laughs> even more so when you have the average IQ of an orc to worry about. But before we get to the captain level, let us instead view the uh, career of crime that an orc freebooter might embark upon to better understand what we're dealing with here. First and foremost, an orc needs to be expelled from his previous clan or tribe or whatever larger group he originally belonged to, though he doesn't theoretically have to be expelled. He could simply decide to leave as well, but once more this is on the far rarer side of things, because belonging to a large group of other orcs means that you are belonging to a large group of things going around smashing and looting other things, which provide ample opportunity for orcs to get their hands on whatever they fancy the most. Furthermore, being surrounded by other orcs means that you are surrounded by other potential pawns and future servants. Very few greenskins will give up on this opportunity, as just like Skaven, they can't see any real reason why they shouldn't be the warboss after all. Anywho, after being expelled, they then need to find themselves a free booters warband to join up with. Unless of course our orc has been particularly ambitious and managed to steal an entire warship by himself, which would be impressive but unlikely, so I think we can fairly safely discount that possibility. 
Now, joining a freebooter's band is, um, well, both easier said than done and also relatively simple. If you are in a main orcish system, chances are the freebooters will come to you, specifically looking for new recruits and replacements after having lost considerable quantities of their own crew to enemy fire or simple mechanical mishaps. See, <laughs> this is... This is one of those things right here that also contributes to the very high failure rate of orc piratical bands. Just like I mentioned with the previous orcs, there are many benefits to remaining part of a larger clan. These benefits are tripled, quadrupled, and quintupled many times over for specialists. Pain boys, weird boys, and mech boys. And so in general, the only way a freebooter's warband is going to acquire the valuable services of such an individual is to hit him over the head with something exceedingly heavy, and then drag his still kicking and screaming body on board their ships, lock him in a cell, and then continue beating him until he finally sees sense. Tragically, however, most clans, tribes, and warbands are exceedingly protective of these specialized individuals due to the valuable nature of their expertise knowledge. They are, therefore, very rarely found looking for a job. As for our average run-of-the-mill greenskin, however, he simply has to wait until a ship heaves into port, sputtering and exploding as it does so, and then go out to find the most extravagantly dressed greenskin he can possibly imagine. Odds are, that's the freebooter's captain, and then offer his services to him directly. The extravagant dress, by the way, is not merely because GW thought to themselves, man, it would be fun to have space pirates, wouldn't it? Actually... I am lying. That is exactly the reason why they're dressed like that, but... Lore-wise, the excuse for dressing them up, like, you know, 18th, 17th century pirates, is that the flamboyant sense of dress makes them easy to spot in a crowd, and therefore allows potential recruits to find them easily. It also has a secondary function as well, allowing those who are looking for a little bit of extra manpower and muscle to also discover the freebooters easily, as they are not merely just pirates, they are also privateers, of sorts anyways. They will hire out their services to the highest bidder, although... Oh, unlike, say, for example, the Blood Axes, they tend to be a hint more particular in who they hire out their services to, preferring other piratical species or simply just orcs. They're not quite as mercenary, therefore, as aforementioned Blood Axes. Nevertheless, mercenary work is, of course, right up the orcish alley, and they will more than happily take hefty donations of teeth or a promise to share the spoils, so long as they can get something to crump nice and easily. Or, well, easily. See, there's another one of those challenges for an up-and-coming freebooter's captain. The orcish instinct to fight anything and everything tends to override their ability to judge whether or not it is smart to fight or not. There's another issue as well. The most successful pirates in our own history were those who were able to pick and choose their targets for maximum bounty and minimum risk. In fact, this is a topic that we will return to a little bit later. Now, back to our orcish boy, our freshly minted little freebooter novice. If he is so unlucky as to not live in a major metropolitan, quote-unquote, orcish hub, then discovering a freebooter's warband to join is more of a question of good old-fashioned luck, really. Occasionally, freebooter bands will stop by smaller worlds again to replenish their numbers, but without a, a natural gathering point, he's basically going to have to hope that they'll land nearby and go, Oi, volunteers, please, or simply just abduct the entire tribe. That is also a distinct possibility and a proud tradition that we ourselves maintained for a very long time as well. I recommend looking up the term shanghai <laughs> Now, there's a fascinating part of naval history as well. Anywho, now that he has joined his 
Grand Warband of Freebooters, or more likely he's gotten aboard one leaky, barely void cable tug, adventure awaits as the ever intrepid and wise captain will set out into the void to get blasted into scrap metal by the first Imperial patrol craft they come across. <laughs> or at least that's what happens to 99% of them, but our story would be cut somewhat short if we were to go for that ending right now. Let us instead assume that our lucky orc has managed to make it onto the crew of one of a very, very tiny number of actually talented orc captains, who may even have been lucky enough to acquire the services of a specialist or two via the application of the most ancient and effective negotiation strategy in human history, blunt force trauma. They will then move on to raid whatever shipping lanes is in the local area. Imperial shipping lanes are often the most preferred simply because they're nice and wealthy, they're rich, they're filled with all manners of fanciful stuff, and they are usually defended by tiny little squishy humans. Now there comes in another question as well, trade in the galaxy of the 41st millennium. This is one of those issues where mere certain problems comes into play. Namely, the fact that the exact time it takes for a fleet to get into range of a planet varies ridiculously so, depending on what book you're reading. In certain instances, an entire fleet can basically just appear above orbit on a planet and attack it instantly, with literally no goddamn warning whatsoever. In other cases, it can take days, even weeks, for ships to coast into the edges of a system. <sighs> Again, this is one of those problems that 40k has never really addressed because they've never really addressed the idea of naval combat all that much. Some cases, for example, ships will blow apart instantly the moment they touch with a single land strike. In other cases, they'll eat hours worth of attacking ammunition like it's gosh darn nothing, and so on and so on. Let us simply now, for the time being, assume that there are trade lanes, and for some mysterious goddamn reason, they are traveling at relatively low velocities, because here's another one of those problems as well. If you are actually doing, hell, not even intergalactic, intergalactic, interplanetary, but intersystem trade, the speeds at which these ships would be traveling would be absolutely absurd. Imagine, for example, if we were sending trade ships from Earth to Mars, right? That's just within our own solar system, a relatively small distance, right? Well, the best way to do this would be to continuously accelerate until you meet the halfway point, at which point you will begin to continuously decelerate, so that you will be having the maximum amount of average speed throughout, whilst being able to reach the maximum possible top speed, again ensuring the maximal average speed. And to give you an indication of the kind of velocities we're talking about here, for a satellite to remain in low Earth orbit, it needs at the least a speed of 17,450 miles per hour. That's almost 8 kilometers per second. <laughs> It's, it's, it's rather nippy. It's, it's rather fast, there's no doubt about it. And even if you're going for the, the slower speeds in high orbit, you're still talking six to 7,000 miles per hour. Again, four or five kilometers a second. And that's just in orbit around us. Like, that's relatively slow again. If you were actually going to be traveling to Mars, you would be increasing that speed many, 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 many times over. And now the question becomes actually intercepting an object traveling at this kind of range, being able to match their speed enough to board it or to remain within engagement range for long enough to actually shoot it down or disable its engines. Basically, interstellar piracy is very, very, very goddamn difficult. And in all due likelihood, it would be something far, far, far beyond the capabilities of an orc to ever even hope to engage in. But again, we are simply just going to put all of that aside for now. 
and accept that orc piracy is a thing and that they are somehow able to prey upon trade lanes of the various species dotted across the 41st millennium. When the Freebooters crew has identified one of these trade lanes, they will, if they are smart, sit in wait for an opportune target. A nice and fat merchantman travelling nice and slow without any kind of an escort. If they are the average Orc Freebooters, they will simply charge screaming at whatever they spot first, regardless of it being a battle cruiser or a merchantman. This um, can quickly introduce a great deal of problems in the life of the average Orc Freebooters, and more than likely our wannabe pirate Orc is going to have to abandon ship more than once over the course of his piratical career. But again, assuming a competent pirate captain has been found, like for example, Captain Bloodflag from the Dawn of War series. This is a lovely little lad and a relative rarity in Orc ranks as well as he has apparently developed an understanding of basic strategy, in that he tries to attack only the things that he feel absolutely certain he is actually capable of trumping. This simple realization that you don't have to attack everything that pops up in front of you will drastically increase the life expectancy of any orc freebooter, and might even lead to the captain amassing quite a following, as the other orcs realize that hey, this one's figured out something that none of the other captains have figured out. <laughs> Again, no matter how basic it might seem, the idea that it is actually possible to only attack merchant shipping rather than the heavily armed patrol vessels is quite the revolutionary idea in the green-skinned world. In turn, therefore, the captain might gather himself a small private fleet, beginning with just one small ship, then maybe becoming two or three, allowing them to take on larger targets, overwhelming any defenders aboard the ship, and maybe even if they're particularly lucky or skilled, they might be able to knock out only key strategic systems, such as void shields or engines, leaving the actual vessel itself more or less intact, making for a grand prize for the freebooter's captain. Meanwhile, our anonymous orc will undoubtedly have been working his way up from the bottom, to partaking in raids, taking over ships, gaining plentiful experience and growing yet larger still, until one day hopefully being a second in command or higher ranking officer amongst the captain's crew. This elevated position will allow him to wait and bide his time until an opportunity presents itself to introduce the forward-thinking captain to another novel concept. Treachery. And it may take many forms, of course. Sometimes airlocks simply cycle by accident, regardless of who is inside of them at the time. If that is the captain and the rest of his command staff, then, well, you know, so much the better. Orcs tend to be rather hearty creatures, so maybe a quick malfunction of the point defense weapons to ensure that there were tragically no survivors might be necessary as well. Or one can go with the more traditional route of simply waiting for a moment where the two are alone and then introducing a sharp pointed object to the lower end of the captain's spine. And hey, such drastic measures may not even be necessary. If Gork and Mork smiles widely enough, our go-getter Captain Wannabe might even see his leader simply be blasted from the void by a particularly truculent target. Once finally wearing the fancy hat, however, it is up to our Orc to fully absorb the many lessons that his predecessor taught him. <laughs> Him. Orcs aren't particularly big on the whole senpai thing, frankly, and so if any lessons were learned, they would probably have to be learned from the commander's desk, hoping to absorb the lessons being taught in real life, in real time in front of them, via the applications of fleet tactics, as far as they go for orcs anyways, and which targets to attack and which targets to ignore. 
Presuming that all of these lessons have actually been learned satisfactorily, the new captain might even be even better than the old one. Since he clearly managed to get rid of the old captain, he must have some qualities that the previous one lacked, after all, obviously. And for particularly successful free booters warband, they might even move beyond the raiding of merchant shipping or naval targets in general. The largest freebooters warbands even move on to raiding entire space stations or even potentially planets. Now, this is a dodgy proposition because it's one thing to attack a merchantman far out into the void, possibly days away from aid, or minutes depending on the version of 40k you're talking about. <clears throat> Anywho, and it is something completely different to attack a space station. They are very, very gosh darn difficult to make. They require a lot of specialized knowledge, they require an absolute ludicrous quantity of resources, and maintaining them is not all that much cheaper, really. Only the largest, most prosperous planets will have them, and they will make damn sure to defend them. Now, they could be smaller void stations a la mining stations. For example, the Imperium employs several stations orbiting gas giants, siphoning off the various valuable raw resources and gases from the ja gas giant beneath it, and these stations are well, basically glorified oil drilling platforms. They are unlikely to possess all that much in the way of weaponry, though even then they will usually have enough to see off the odd small piratical raid, otherwise <laughs> they would literally just be there for easy pickings and, you know, I bet it would get annoying replacing them all the time, so a few guns are to be expected. But the even worse thing, of course, would be an actual planetary raid. Now, usually these will take the form of smash and grab hits. Again, we need to return to that whole idea about how long it takes to approach a planet and the fact that anything the size of an orc fleet would be detected long, long in advance of them actually arriving, but skipping happily past that, assuming that the Orc Captain has the capabilities to do so, these would probably be aimed towards areas of lesser interest, assuming that local planetary governors would not put as much effort into defending them. There is a big difference in, for example, if your trajectory is heading towards a rural community in the middle of nowhere, or if it is heading towards a primary hive city. One of these is going to be a hell of a lot more heavily defended than the other, and any fleet assets like planetary defense boats will probably be gathered around the hive target rather than the rural community. This can allow Orc freebooters to gain considerable loot with relatively little risk, albeit well, again, depending somewhat on the target, it could be a huge success if they hit a relatively rich mining community, for example, lots of ore, presuming the orcs are capable of hauling it back into orbit, which presents another set of problems, doesn't it? Hauling vast quantities of raw ore into orbit is likely to cost you more in the way of fuel than you're unlikely to benefit, but once again, ignoring all of this there are certainly worthwhile targets out there. In some extreme circumstances, there might even be freebooters fleets large enough to engage entire planets and actually actively invade them with the intent of staying for an extended period. Either to simply loot absolutely everything, and this can be a very valuable thing as well. Though. Well, it's kind of a necessary thing, really. Once a freebooter's warband has arrived at the point where they are capable of taking on entire planets, they are likely in absolutely desperate need for resources, for guns, for production capabilities, for industry, for everything required to make more and bigger starships, and, perhaps even more importantly, they will be in need of reputation. Remember how we talked about specialists and how, by and large, clans will be very hesitant to give over theirs to a bunch of maddened-ass piratical bastards? Well, that changes somewhat if the maddened-ass piratical bastards are powerful enough to invade entire planets. 
At that point, they are likely to actually be bringing entire clans and other warbands along with them as additional allies, as the Freebooters group will at that point have transitioned well, into less of a raiding fleet and more of a full-scale warg, really. Though, it's not guaranteed. A warg is a very specific orc military manoeuvre, and mm, a freebooter's warband, would they theoretically qualify? I mean, there's nothing stopping them, they just wouldn't be the usual main protagonists, shall we say. Having reached these dazzling heights, our orc now stands at the top of Freebooter society. Our word doesn't really work here. He finds himself at the top of a very large mountain of garbage and other orcs. Yes, more fitting. And what can stop him now? Well, in all due likelihood, he will now have become an actual planetary threat. And he's not going to be dealing with patrol crafts anymore. Rather, elements of the Imperial Navy will have to be dispatched to hunt down the pirates and crush them. This, incidentally, is also one of the main tasks of larger Imperial Navy formations. Shit like uh, guarding trade lanes is usually left to PDF forces or very localized Navy elements, destroyers, light cruisers at the absolute most, whereas the main force of the Imperial Navy will be dealing with large scale pirates, either destroying their ships, hunting them down, destroying their bases, or simply just driving them out of the system. Because once they leave their area of responsibility, well, they're somebody else's problem now, aren't they? And at the end of the day, killing them or making them somebody else's problem, both solutions are equally final for the local commander. In fact, the latter might be the better one, as he won't have to expend anywhere near the same quantity of resources to achieve it. And if the leader of a freebooter's warband has any sense, he will be avoiding direct confrontation with the Imperial Navy, as they tend to be less well-equipped than um, even proper orcish wags, and much, much less so, before they reach the planetary raiding stage. You see, again, it comes down to the specialists. Lacking in pain boys, mad mechs, or weird boys, they will have less in the way of fancy customized weaponry, of armor, and even proper bionicle replacements. This is another one of the reasons why you will see a lot of freebooters with classical pirate accessories like hooked hands and so on, because well, without a pain boy to provide them with a proper replacement, simply hammering in a hook in a stump is about as good as it gets. And considering just how sturdy the orc physiology is, they probably aren't going to complain over much. The presence or lack of whingy noises, however, does not make them all that much more battlefield effective. A hooked hand will remain a hooked hand, probably not the finest of weapons. This fact notwithstanding, though, orc raiders, pirates, and indeed freebooters can still be a significant military threat, certainly on a local level, and remain a big danger to trade traffic throughout the Imperium, and a problem for many of the lesser races of the 41st millennium as well. And hopefully with this video, you will have gained a slightly better understanding of the freebooters. Until next time, I have been Arch, thank you all very much for listening, and I hope to see you all again soon. Till then, have a good day.